So we've been talking about supervised learning and the goals, the idea behind supervised learning was to take data that we have information, known information, and be able to try to make guesses about future things that were going to happen. We get new data and try to determine if it's classification, uh, if the idea is to say we have this new uh, bit of data and we want to determine a category for it, we have classification. If we're trying to predict an appropriate output value, like a numerical value, instead of classification, that's called regression. Uh, but the idea is the same. We're trying to use known information to make a prediction about a future scenario. And so if we're making a decision tree, the idea is to, as far as the learning approach goes, is to learn a correct tree that gives us the right answer at least most of the time. Uh, of course, if it's a correct tree, giving a, a correct answer every time. Um, but that idea of the real function, f of x equals y, whatever the x happens to be, whatever the y uh, happens to be, is it a, a collection of attributes, like a, a vector input, uh, what kind of output, it might be a classification thing, it might be a true-false, it might be uh, actual numerical situ situation. And then our estimate function takes the same input and gives something, uh, I don't know, call it y hat. Um, probably a bad choice because that's used in other ways. Let's put a tilde. Um, so some other output. Um, and the question is, can we find the right hypothesis, right? So this is a, a, an approximation function. And we talked about that being the goal of supervised learning, to come up with some method, some approximate answer. Uh, and the closer the approximate answer is to the real answer, then the better fit, we say, the model is. So when we talk about how good the fit is, we often talk about the error rate of, of the method. What does that mean? Uh, the error rate corresponds to the proportion of mistakes that it makes. Right, so error rate is... So what will we do? Sometimes uh, we will talk about a particular model being 95% correct or whatever. And this is based on from the, from the training to the test data. And then that's how correct we expect it to be going forward. Now, is that a guarantee? Well, what if our training data wasn't really representative of what happens with other data? Then it might not in practice turn out to be 95% correct. Um, and so we're talking about um, that tr training error rate is really what we're considering here. This is based on what we know to have happened. Well, if you have a low training error rate, it, again, it does not always mean that it will generalize well. We might overfit so that we have something that is too in tune with the training or the, the training data. And so we've made it specific to the training data and so it doesn't carry over well to other scenarios. So it works really well with the training and test data, but then doesn't carry over well. Uh, or maybe it works really well, too well with the training, so it doesn't even work well in, in testing. Um, and so, and then definitely, uh, again, the situation can happen that it doesn't work well in real life scenarios. Um, and so part of that problem can be overfitting. Part of that problem can be the kind of data that we have access to. There can be lots of, of other reasons. Uh, part of it can be that we did our training in a, kind of like a, um, a lab kind of setting, like a, a clean setting, whereas the real data has a lot of noise in it and other, other issues and so that we couldn't account for or didn't account for. Um, but 
So one idea of this in terms of coming up with a better model uh, is to try to minimize the error rate. So minimizing the error rate uh, seems to make sense, at least as, as part of a plan uh, for, for creating a good model. Again, we're not necessarily creating the model. We're often allowing or creating a scenario where the system can learn an appropriate model. Right? So that's what's happening with the neural networks in terms of the, the back propagation and, and all of that is updating the values to create the new model and hopefully creating a better model. That's what hap happens with the uh, decision trees. If we don't create the trees, but we create this, this setting for the trees to develop from the set of all possible trees to narrow down and develop uh, selecting the choice of tree that does the job best. Again, best is, is um, open to different interpretations. Well, minimizing error rate is definitely better than, say, maximizing the error rate, right? Um, but when we think about that, the uh, you know the pro uh, a pro something in favor of this is that you have would have fewer errors at least in your in your training uh, situation, but a, a another aspect if we just focus on minimizing the error rate, um, the issue can be what kind of errors have we made, right? So if we think about the kinds of errors that we that we can make, if it's classification that we're doing, for instance. So someone had mentioned something just a minute ago uh, about spam, something being spam or not being spam. So what if our task is to classify things as spam or not spam? So we have our data comes in, right? So what happens? Things come in, which would be a message, and we're going to classify it as spam or as not spam. Well, we learn with supervised learning. Yes, this is spam, this is not spam, this is spam, this is not spam. And our model, whatever it happens to be, if it's a decision tree, if it's a, a network, whatever, whatever kind of model we have, we get this thing that comes in, and now we've declared it spam or not spam. OK, so on one hand, we have the, the prediction right, that it was spam or not spam. On the other hand, we have the real answer. So this is the real answer. Well, what happens if it's spam and we predict that it's spam? We were correct. What happens if it's not spam and we predict that it's not spam? Then we were correct. So in those two cases, the y, the correct answer, is equal to the prediction. What happens in the other cases? In the other two cases, if it's spam and we say that it's not, that's an error. And if it's not spam and we say that it is, that's an error. So if all we cared about was, which I erased our goal here, was minimizing the error rate, if we just care about minimizing the error rate, then we don't really care what kind of error it is. But let's think about it. Are these two errors created equally? Are, they the, are, is the, are the ramifications the same in both cases? Which is worse? If it's not spam and it's predicted as spam, you think that's worse? What if it is spam and it says it's not? What's the, what, what are the downsides? You'll see the spam. And if it's just spam and not like phishing or something, then what do you have? Then you just see the spam. What if it's not spam and it's called spam? You miss it, you miss it and it could be really important. 
Right? So in that sense, we kind of think this is a worse error to have. So what might happen? We might not just say, oh, let's reduce the percentage of errors. It's let's reduce the percentage of errors in particular that we want to reduce this kind of error, even if it means a few more of those. So the problem is you can't just say, so let's say, say that the only type of error is barking and not spam emails spam, because then the Right. So again, we, yeah, we can't just say let, let's make sure we avoid this completely. Then it would, then it might just say, oh, let's mark nothing as spam. We don't make any of this kind of error. So what do we have? We have like a, a dual purpose here: reduce the number of errors, but what would be better? would be better might be if there are a few more errors overall, but fewer of these. So you get kind of competing purposes. And so the kind of error matters. So what do you do? You would like to tilt the system in a way that, yes, we want to minimize the error rate. But in particular, we want to make sure that this kind of error is less likely whilst simultaneously reducing the rate. So they're not always it's not always easy to carry that out because you have competing ends. Um, the the more uh, extreme version of this is in terms of guilty or not guilty in a criminal trial. Right? What's the so this is the pre, this is the like the prediction not really not a prediction this is the result of having analyzed the data and here's what the jury decides and so this is the jury result which again corresponds to the same idea because how does the prediction work the prediction works based on let's look at the data look at the input and give our give our response. Well, what is the input in a jury trial? The input is the cases that are presented. Right? The prosecution presents a case. The defense presents a case. And so what's the real situation? The real is that the person is guilty or that the person is innocent, which is different than not guilty. Because what does not guilty mean in terms of the output of the trial? It means that you're not that you're not you're not proved innocent. It's determined that there was not enough evidence to prove your guilt, right? Um, so what is happening in this case? Again, if the if the person is guilty and the jury says guilty, that was okay. If the, per, if the person was actually innocent and the jury says not guilty, that's okay. And now we have these two errors here. All right, what is happening in this case? What is the, what is the status quo going into the trial? What's, right? Innocent until proven guilty is the context. context. So what is the uh, expected outcome with no information at all? If neither side presented the case, the jury should say not guilty, right? Um, and so this situation of the person being innocent, being not guilty, and saying and them saying guilty means that they have done what? If the person was not guilty, was innocent actually, and the jury says guilty, They have moved away from, they've allowed the data to say, I need to change my mind. Right? I have, I've gone in with the idea that this person is not guilty, and now I am changing my mind. But I'm changing my mind and making a mistake. So what do we get right here? We have this kind of, of false positive. Right? It's a false response, but it's a positive in the sense of I'm changing away from what it what it should have been. So this kind of scenario is what statisticians call a type one error. 
um, where you are rejecting what's called the null hypothesis, the, the status quo. You reject the status quo and go with the alternative, but you do so and make a mistake. Does that make sense? So, and then so the other is a type 2, all right? Um, and so in this context, which do you think is worse? For a guilty person to be found not guilty, or for an, an innocent person to be found guilty? Which is, which is the worst of the two scenarios? Yeah, so what if, what if you have an innocent person that is, say, let's go to the extreme, life in prison or execution, and they were innocent? On the other hand, what happens if a guilty person is allowed to go free? That can be bad too, right? So it's really hard to say, in some cases, which is, which is worse. Um, but usually, what do you try to, uh, what, what would most people think of? It's probably worse to have someone in prison who shouldn't be than to have someone free who should be in prison. Because there are lots of people out there roaming around who probably should be in prison for something. Right? Just pick something. You probably should be in prison for that. Um, but what happens? Um, there, there's a there's a different level of how bad these are. If we go back to this situation again, the first, most of you said right away, "Oh, if it wasn't spam, we called it spam." That's worse than the other situation. But what if that spam contains? malware and you just just by by receiving it you know you 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 get the that could be a problem too right so um so the situation of the types of errors and and controlling one type of error what happens if you want to make sure this never happens if you want to make sure that an innocent person is never found guilty what could you do Right? Never send anyone to prison. But what happens in that case? Then you've made mistakes here. But what happens in those cases? We don't always know if the person was actually guilty or not. Right? Uh, so those, those kinds of errors, um, you know, you've made a new error. It's really difficult to tell in that case as well. Unless after the trial, at least in the United States, you can't be tried on exactly the same charge again. So after the trial, it was, it was like, okay, did you do it? Yeah, I did it. Okay, now we know we made a mistake that time. But that's not how it happens, right? Um, so these type of errors, trying to reduce those, sometimes you want to reduce one, sometimes you want to reduce, you want to reduce all, you know, both of them overall as much as you can, but doing so always ends up with a, a, a kind of a balancing act between uh, it's kind of like a time-space trade-off that we have in, in other scenarios, right? If you want to speed something up, it usually takes more space to do that. If you want to use less space, it usually takes more time. Um, all right, so the idea uh, that we often then look at is rather than simply reducing the error rate, We look at a concept called utility. And this concept of utility comes from, um, comes from economics in terms of what will the user or what will the situation get out of this result. So the question is kind of like the, the, the goal would be to maximize utility. Um, but we think about what happens. We have h of x is the output. So what happens 
when we use this output instead of the correct output. Well, if you use that output instead of the correct output, the idea is that something is lost. The user loses out on something. And so we try to quantify what the user has lost out on. All right, so we have this kind of loss function that says, all right, given this input, given a particular input, with this correct answer and this answer received, we look at something like uh, this loss function, something like the utility of using the correct answer So some numerical calculation in some way that we figured out how to describe that, minus the utility of using the y tilde given the x input. Right, so we say some way of like, if we had the right answer, how happy would we be? But now we don't have the right answer, how happy are we? What's the difference in that? And, that's the, and what we want to do is minimize this value. What happens if we have the right answer? What if this is equal? What if these are equal? Then the loss, then the loss function gives zero, right? The utilities are the same because you have the same answer. Well, what happens in other situations? And we have to figure out how to, how to quantify that or what to do in that case. And there's a whole uh, area, area of, of um, economic theory that goes into utility theory and, and um, in terms of figuring out what's an appropriate thing to use in different scenarios. Well, in some of this, some people have uh, provided tools uh, to, to be able to just, uh, in this kind of situation, this is what you want to use for your utility measurement. Right? So it's comparable, in a sense, to our uh, genetic algorithm function that we've been looking at that would say, here's your response, here's, here's a value. Right? This is a value that we've placed on a particular answer. It's worth this much to you. This other one is worth this much to you. Um, so again, we're not going to do anything in terms of implementing this, but, that, but that, focusing on that idea that we can't just minimize the error rate because you can eliminate error rate in certain ways, but then we can, can still have problems with making the mistakes uh, otherwise. Um, and then what happens if we if we rule out other things? Then we're creating errors in new situations, and um, uh, I mean we would never declare anything spam, and we would create these kinds of errors. Uh, um, we get rid of this one, but then that one would go way up, right? And so um, so the check mark parts still are good, right? Everything that is declared spam really would be spam, but nothing would be declared spam. So we would have the errors would have gotten shifted off to the other to the other column. Um, okay, so that idea of how do you figure out the best fit for a model, even that is involves a whole bunch of new of new areas, right? So what are we looking at? We're looking at very simplified approach. We're strictly going to look at the error rate based on our training data to our test data. And see how well our different models do on the on the on the test data, but we should recognize that that is very far from the whole picture. There's a lot more involved in terms of picking out the best model uh, for a particular situation. Okay, so uh, really, when it comes down to those predictions, we're not usually saying that this is the answer we're thinking of. It's really in terms of the answer. Uh, it's, it's all probabilistic, saying the answer is probably this value or probably in this range, probably close to this. To this. Um, and so to talk about this, we need a little bit of the, of the concept of what like statistical or probabilistic reasoning corresponds to. So let's say that we had... a bag of sweets that some company produced. And let's say that this is a very uh, evil company that packages every flavor in exactly the same looking package. You cannot tell. And when you open the package, you can't tell until you put it in your mouth. 
which flavor you got. And so um, the as far as sweets are concerned and the and the artificial flavoring, I agree with the authors of the textbook uh, on the example that they used. Um, so they have this idea of there are, say this company provides five different bags of, of these of these sweets. The H1 category is 100% Cherry sweets. The H5 category is 100% lime. But if we really wanted to make it bad, let's think of all of the fake candies. Let's make it banana. Because banana flavored sweets are never banana flavored. And they're, in my opinion, horrible and should never happen. OK, although fake cherry flavoring I usually am OK with. All right, so um, then we have these other. So, we, But you can't tell them apart, right? You can't tell them apart until you put it in your mouth. Is it banana? Is it cherry? All right. Then in between, we have other categories. Um, this one, this package that they produce is 75% cherry and then 25% banana. And then this one is 50-50. And this one is the other way around, right? 25% cherry, 75% banana. And so what is happening in the context of like statistical learning is we are trying to figure out which one of these bags we happen to have. So our idea is the, the hypothesis, H, is our guess, our best guess, as, as to what kind of bag we happen to have purchased. So how do we determine what type of bag of sweets we have? Right. <laughs> try one, right? Take one out and try it. All right, so what do we do? We'll open the package, we'll take one out, we'll try it. So data point one, right? Now, depending on which kind it is, we can immediately eliminate one or the other of these. But then we're down to these, right? But before we've opened that first one, what do we think? What's, what's the likelihood of any particular situation? Oh, we kind of think of it, it could be one out of five. Any, it could be any one of them, right? If they're equally created and so on, it could be any one of the five. As soon as we open the first one and taste it, what do we know? We've ruled out one of these two. Yep. Who's this banana cherry? <laughs> Say what? Banana cherry. Well, it means like half of the pieces are banana and half of the pieces are cherry. Not that the flavor is this it's weird mix. Accident. Manufacturing accident. Um, so, so then it would be like H6, which would be like burn the whole bag, right? Yeah. Um, OK, so we get that first data point, And it will tell us something, but then it still doesn't tell us about, say, what's left. So let's say the first one, unfortunately, was banana. So what do we know? We know we didn't get this one. So we use the data, and we can say something about the original. We can do this in, in tree form or whatever, however, right? We can, we'll think about that. But this definitely tells us that it was not the bag of 100% cherry 
sweets. Then what do we do? Take out another one. If we know it, if it's cherry, then we know it's not this one. If it's banana, we haven't ruled anything out. Right? What might we have done, though, we might have reduced the possibilities of certain things. Yeah. Right? Because what if there are only... 100 candies. What, I was going to say four candies. Yeah. What if there are only four candies in, in, in the bag? What have we done? Once we have the second one being banana... We, know we have ruled something out, right? Yeah. So what we've ruled does depend on how many are actually available in the bag. Okay, so what happens? The more data we get, eventually certain things will be ruled out. So and, I'm sorry? Yeah, the more data points we have, we're still predicting, but it gets better, right? Our prediction gets better. With one or two data points, it could still be a lot of things. With more and more and more data points, the better and better it gets. How would we know for sure that we were in this category? Well, we could, we could eat all of them, but would we have to eat all of them? No. We'd have to go far enough to rule this one out, right? Right. Once you get to seventy-six percent banana, we could stop and say, "Okay, this whole this well, whole." If you had four pieces, you would have to eat all of them. Yes. Right. With four pieces, only four pieces, we would have to eat all of them to know which category we were in. Be holding out hope, right? Holding out. This last one will be cherry, right? And then we. Um, so what happens? This is the idea of statistical learning, right? In that sense of. We're looking at data, and this is what the whole aspect is, right? We look at the data, and we make our prediction based on the data that we have available to us. Except in this case, what are we doing? There's only one of five things that it could be, and we're using up the, the data to try to determine which category uh, it, it falls into. Right? Now, let's say they were different colors once you finally opened the package. Right, you finally take the wrapper off, and you can see, okay, it's, it's a different color. So you know, you know which is which. Well, what could we do? Again, we start opening them, but maybe we can avoid eating those banana. Right? Just wrap them back up. Give them to somebody else. Right? So that's what people do with, with like chocolates that are in a box. Right? You pick up the one, and, and you bite into it, and it's coconut. You, you turn it, and you put it back in, like, and you hide it so that people don't realize that you've already taken a bite off it. Uh, let somebody else have the have the, the during coconut. COVID, that's, uh... Perfect, perfect. Yes, you always do that, right? During during COVID, you definitely. And during cold season, flu season, you definitely uh, always, right? Uh, no. <laughs> um, so what happens if you can't tell by looking at the outside of something? Then the only way to access the data is to use that thing up. Right? So if you bite it and it's coconut and you don't like coconut, then you throw it away. If you do like coconut, then you eat that one, right? Um, so what could you do in the case of the things looking exactly the same? You would have to destroy it to, to determine. Otherwise, with, if it were like chocolate-coated thing, I guess you could test each one of them by cutting it open and looking on the inside to see what's in there, right? Um, and so it wouldn't completely destroy it. You know, It could still be whatever. Anyway. That's not the point of the, of the process. The point of the process is as you get more data, then certain hypotheses are no longer valid. But until you have collected that data, all of these hypotheses are equally valid. It could have been any of them. Now, this is based on as long as the company created equal numbers of these. What if the company realized that the cherry are way more expensive to, to create, way more expensive to produce, and they sell all of these bags at the same price. They might lie about what's in the bag? Well, not that they would lie about what's in the bag. It's just they would become less likely that you had one of these bags. So it would be more likely that you had one of these, less likely that you had these. And in that case, your initial uh, estimate of the probabilities wouldn't be one in five. It would be whatever the, the company production schedule 
happen to be. Okay, so in order to do something le uh, legitimate with this kind of scenario, we need a little bit about probability. And so we're not going to go a lot uh, into, uh, into the details, but just enough uh, to be able to solve some of the kinds of problems that we, that we care about. Okay, so when we talk about probability, The idea is that we are, on one hand, kind of in a classical probability sense, is we're thinking about so the probability of some event. Being the number of ways the event can happen. Divided by the number of things that can happen. So this is kind of a preliminary, kind of naive way when we have equally likely things happening. So you think about those five different bags of sweets. We have one, two, three, four, five. And if they were all, so these are the outcomes, which is called a sample space. These are the possible outcomes. And then we talk about the likelihood or the probability of that outcome. Um, and if they were all equally likely, we would say each of these probabilities would be one in five. And this is what's called a probability distribution. This is a discrete probability distribution because there are only a limited number, a finite number of things that can happen. What happens with all the probabilities? All of the probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1, and they all add up to be 1 because one of these things will happen. And so this is the, the general idea of, of like the basic context of probability. Gets a lot more complicated from there, but that's the initial starting point. So if we think, say, of flipping a coin, flipping a fair coin, what are the possible outcomes? Heads or tails. So this is what we can call the sample space, the possible outcomes. I'm just going to call it S. And the probabilities? We would expect half and half, and that's kind of the kind of the theoretical possibilities that happen. Now, what happens in real life? In real life, the coin might be a little heavier on one side than the other because it's been used, and so it's, it's not weighted perfectly. Uh, it might also be that when a person flips the coin, that they flip it in a certain way each time that somehow puts one of these being more likely than the other. Um, it could be that... Um, when you flip a coin, could something else ever happen? Could land on it could land on its edge. That's a potential thing, right? It could bounce all, bounce if, all over the place and fall down the sewer drain. It, but it still would have landed heads or tails. We just wouldn't necessarily know which. Um, what happens if we flip the coin, catch it, and you know, lay it on our arm? Then it won't be on its side, right? It will be one or the other of these. Um, I don't know if he can still do this. I haven't talked to him about it for a long, long time. I need to ask him. Paul used to be able to flip a coin, and so he would know where it was, heads up or tails up, flip it, count how many times it spun, put it back, and call it correctly every time. I don't know if he can still do that. Uh, um, so I'll have to ask him. If you see him, ask him. Um, could always flip the coin the way, call it correctly, right? Uh, but only after it had come back down, before, before the reveal, right? But when you say call it in the air, what happens? Right? And he had to be the one flipping and making the call, right? It's like if you flip it and he calls, 
doesn't know how you how how you started it, even if he counts the number of flips, can't tell what it was going to be. All right. Um, so what would happen if the again that's that corresponds to the sample space of of outcomes? Uh, what if you roll a die? Let's say we roll a regular six-sided die. Right? We're rolling a six-sided die. What would be the sample space? All right, the expected outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the probabilities? If the die, or if the die is fair and balanced, then each of these are equally likely. So what if you roll the die and you roll a six? And you roll it again and you roll another six? And you roll it again and you roll another six? And you keep rolling it and you keep getting a six? You think that it might be a weighted die? You think about like a cheap die that comes with you know, like, a, like a board game. What happens? Which side is the heaviest side of, of a cheap die? Right? What happens? Each side of the die has like a bit dug out of it, and then it's just painted in. And so what happens? The one has the least amount dug out of it, so that would make the one side a little bit heavier. Now that's not the case in, say, dice in, in a casino. What do they do? Those are dug out and then replaced with material of a different color but the same exact weight. So they're smooth all the way around, and they have they they are maintained. The balance is maintained, and then they're not used very many times because they start would start getting worn or something, right? So they're taken out of out of action. Um, so what would happen um, if you kept rolling sixes? What would you think? You just have this. You ha you, ha you, ha you haven't looked at it. Right? You just keep rolling it. It keeps coming up six. What do you think? You think it's balanced? It's it's unfairly balanced? It's weighted? That could be one possibility. What could another possibility be? Extremely lucky. Extremely lucky. Uh, what else could it be? What's another valid hypothesis? The way you're rolling, picking it up and rolling it is in the exact same manner. So you're picking up and rolling it in the exact same manner, and, yeah. and it's completely deterministic in the output. If you do everything exactly the same, you get exactly the same thing every time. The dice only has sixes on it, right? The die only has sixes. Because I said we're just picking up and rolling it. We're not looking at it. So which of these is the most likely hypothesis? A bunch of different hypotheses. Which is most likely for correctness? And right there's, there's different things to determine most likely for correctness. Um, what does Occam's razor say is pick whichever of those most likely or likely things that are, is the least complicated. Right, so of those, which is the least complicated uh, version? Probably that it was a way to die. But if you, in some situations, it might be that there are only sixes on, on the sides. Is it that you're rolling it exactly the same way every time and getting exactly the same thing happen every time? Probably not, right? Is it that there's a magnet in there and the person is, keeps turning on the magnet at just the right time to flip it to the six? Probably not, right? Um, so, which is most likely sometimes depends on which is the least complicated explanation. Um, there's, there's a movie from, I don't know, sometime in the early to mid 90s, um, where there's a character that tells a story through multiple times throughout, says that and he keeps flipping a, co a coin, and says that he's been told that when the, if the coin lands on its side, then you can see the future. And through the whole movie, he's flipping this quarter and it's not landing on its side. And then there's this whole kind of action thing going on and there's, I don't know, people chasing other people and people getting killed and whatever. And um, the movie's called Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, um, and which is an actual town in New Mexico. But anyway, that's... Um, and so... At the very end of the movie, the coin lands on its side, and it gets to see the future. 
And since you're never going to see this movie, 30 year spoiler alert? Is that, is that, too, is that too soon for the, for the spoiler alert? He sees the future, which is someone walking through the door and shooting him, which immediately happens. Like, it lands, he sees the future, and then it happens. Um, there's another movie which is based on a play. Um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are two minor characters in Hamlet. And so what this play and then the corresponding movie does um, is follow Rosencrantz and Guildenstern through Hamlet. So sometimes the scenes that they're in that are in, in regular Hamlet, they're, it's scenes from Hamlet. But other times, it's whatever they were doing when they're not on stage on, on, in Hamlet, right? Um, and one of them is flipping a coin, starts off the movie flipping a coin all the way through, or all the way through the story, um, is flipping a coin, heads, 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 through the whole film, or, uh, from the film perspective. I'm not exactly sure about the play because I've never seen the play. But the screenplay was written by the person that wrote the play, so I'm pretty sure it's. Also, along the way, um, the, that same character, which you're never quite sure whether it's Rosencrantz or Guildenstern because they're never quite sure which is which, um, there's a bunch of pots, pl flower pots hanging, and the character pulls out a pot and connects with the others, and the other one on the other end taps out. Right? One, two, hit, two come out. Right? A uh, few other things that this character uh, is doing: dropping things and from different, you know, two, two different weight things, dropping them, and they're both hitting the ground at the same time. Right? This is supposed to be in what the 1400s or something when Hamlet is set. Uh, so before other people had discovered all these different principles. So then at one point the character says, "Check out this coin flip." Flips it and it comes up. Tails. <laughs> Done the flower pot thing, pulls out three of the flower pots, lets them go, they smash. Drops two things, have been dropping all these things, drops two things, but one of them is like a rock and one of them is a feather. So the rock just hits the ground and the feather just. So the other character the whole time is like, what are you trying to show me? What's, what's this all about? Well, so what was it? It was all this data that they're collecting and thinks that he's found a pattern to it. And then something changed in the data, right? So the pattern, which are these true physical properties, if certain other conditions are met, then there's one change in the conditions. And so those patterns then, the prediction of what this character expects to have happen next, because it has happened every time up to now, suddenly changes. Isn't this part of the thing that Christina was exploit was like, Oh, the roulette wheel shows the results of all the previous spins, so people are like, oh, this one spun red ten times. I'm going to go bet red on it. Well, so there can be something to that of people believing uh, that things are connected that aren't connected. And flipping the coin, what happens? If it's truly a coin toss, what happened before has nothing to do with what's going to happen next. It's always 50-50. Is there a chance of coming up with 10 heads or 100 heads in a row? Yeah, I mean, it could happen. It's a non-zero probability of that happening. It's closer and closer and closer to zero, right, the more of those you put in a row. But the next one does not depend in any way on the ones that came before. I, I, I didn't hear what you said. The dream speedrunning drama where apparently they, there was a game mechanic based around chance and there was a, and a study showed that one individual who was speedrunning the game was getting more lucky than expected over a very long period. I there is, there's been a lot of videos on YouTube about it. Because okay. It is, it is, there's no, the only proof of he cheated is he's too lucky. There are situations where, um, like, people who do, uh, like, the, the forensic analysis of uh, like economic things, people who are, what, what are those called, like forensic accountants, um, they can sometimes tell that people have cheated on numbers, tax forms, and so on, because the, the numbers that they've made up have a pattern to them, or don't have enough of a pattern. 
And they've made up numbers to put in, the, and they don't have enough of a pattern. And it's like they tried too hard to be random, so they were too random. And again, not random because they were making it up, but they were trying, or maybe they, they did something. And so the kind of patterns, what would you expect? If I asked you to write down 100 digits, how often would you put five zeros in a row? You probably wouldn't do it very often. If I just had write down 100 digits at random, you probably wouldn't put five zeros in a row very often. And, but, but it should happen sometimes. Certain things should You wouldn't put the same number in a row too many times. Because you would think, oh, OK, that's not, that doesn't look random anymore. And so you would break things that really would happen in a random scenario. Does everybody have like a, 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 a no, no, notebooks? Nobody has a book or a notebook or anything. Um, do you have a book or a notebook? Get, a, get something out that you can. And if you don't have a book or a notebook, pretend, right? You have your book or notebook closed in front of you. And so what I want us to do is to randomly just open it and so think of it like in, in the old days if it, if it were a phone book. We're going to pick a name out of the phone book. So you open it up and you point to a place on the page, right? So just open it up and point to And I want everyone to physically do this even if you don't have a book, right? Open it. I want to see you open it and point to a place on the page. OK, so you have some name. I've been able to, to follow a couple of you. Uh, you have some place that would correspond to a name or whatever, right? All right, now let's close it. Open it up and let's do this again. All right, let's open it up, do this again. And the two of the three people I was watching didn't do the second time. So I can't say <laughs> what I was going <laughs> to. Most of you used the same finger and pointed to the same gener general location on the same side of the notebook. We pointed to different did, did you? Well, you were using the same one, so that could have that could have an effect. One per two people using the same book could could modify this. But what happened? The three that I was watching, all when you opened it up, pointed with the same hand. Same finger, same side of the book, roughly to the same, now different page, but roughly. And so what is that? Is that random? No, we've left out the possibility of people on the other page or in the different places on that page. Okay, now let's do it one more time. Close the book, open it, and point. Now that I've told you that, some of you start to do that, and then you move your hand. Is that random? No, that breaks it again, right? So random is much more um, not just haphazard like that, like that. Now, how many of you, even if you didn't point to the same place, how many of you opened to page one? Probably no. If it were a phone book, probably no one would have opened to page one of the. So, what does that mean about people whose last names start with the letter A? How many of you opened to the very last page? No. What do you, most people do when you're saying do that? You open somewhere to the middle. And so again, randomness is very different than what we often think of as being random. Um, okay, so that's completely a, an aside from where from where we need to go. But that sense of when we are gathering data, and if the data is supposed to be based on randomness, then how we gathered it matters. And so if you didn't gather data in a good way. What happens to your model? Your model might not be very good. If your model depends on randomly collected data, and it wasn't randomly collected, even and you didn't know that, you can do all this work with your model, and then your model can be, can be just rubbish. If your model doesn't depend on randomly generated data, then it's probably rubbish anyway, right? In that, in that context. Because if it doesn't depend on randomly generated data, then it means it depends on data that's generated in a specific way. 
And then what happens when you get new data that wasn't generated the way you generated your own data? Now, if all the data is generated according to some particular pattern and you're trying to find out what that pattern is, then it's OK, right? As long as the data that you're using to build your model isn't specific to a particular scenario. All right, so what do we want to look at? We want to think about probability. So that's the, the basic sense. Um, but what happens if instead of a single one si uh, one, uh, a single fair six-sided die that's the typical die that actually does have the numbers one through six that's not all sixes, so we have two dice. What happens when we roll two dice? What do we normally do when you, when you are playing a game that involves rolling dice? You roll two of them, what do you normally do? You roll them at the same time, and then usually you end up doing what? Usually you end up adding the values together, right? The, the number of pips, the number of pips that are showing. You add those, you, you add those together, and that is your output. So what outputs are possible? Again, that's one way. A different thing could be, oh, the the, the, the dice one is red, one is blue, and we roll them and we see the distinction, and, and the output is the red one was this and the blue one was that. But typically in a game that involves rolling dice, you roll the dice and then you add up the total number of dots that are that are showing. So what, what would the sample space be in that scenario of roll the dice at the same time, add the pips? Right? The outcomes that are possible. Are two through two through twelve. How many outcomes is that? There are eleven of them, right? So are the probabilities one over eleven, one over eleven, one over eleven? No, they're not. Right? So what happens in this situation? Now some outcomes are more likely than others. So how many things in all can happen? How many? Yeah, 36. The first die has six possibilities. The second one has six possibilities. So there are 36 different things that can happen. Because even though we don't care which one was first and which one was second, one of them is first and one of them is second. So to keep track of it, we could imagine that they were red and blue, even though they're not. And so that will, there are 36 different things that can happen in terms of which die shows which value. But of those 36, a lot of them give the same number after we've added the dots together. So how many ways are there to roll a 2? There's just one way to roll a 2. And the one way to roll a 2 means that the probability of that is 1 out of 36. Right? And what about how many ways are there to roll a 3? There are two ways to roll a 3. And this keeps going, right? How many ways are there to roll? How many ways are there to roll a a four? So what are the three ways to roll a four? A one, a three, or a three and a one, and a two and a two. Right? So we can keep track. Uh, there are three ways here. What about a five? So one way to, to organize this is we could make a table. Just one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Imagine this is the red die and this is the blue die, even though there's not really a red and blue die, right? Um, what happens if they both roll one, roll ones? That's a two. Here's where the threes come from, the fours. You get a 5 here, you get a 5 there, a 5 there, or a 5 there. Right? It keeps going. What happens here? There's 7s.
And then what happens? Then it goes backward in terms of the number of things that are possible, right? All right, so which is most likely to happen? Which single thing is most likely to happen? Rolling a seven. Because it doesn't matter what the first die is, there's a possibility that the second one can add up to seven. Right? What if we're trying to roll a five? Well, if we've already rolled a six, then a five is out of the question. And so a five is less likely. So what happens if we go on up? Uh, well, there are four, four fives. How many sevens are there? There are six sevens. What about sixes? We look at, there are five of them, right? Five ways. And then what happens? Starts going back down. And how do you roll a 12? You have to get two sixes, so there's only one way to do that. What happens if you add up those numerators? You get 36, right? Because what will happen if you roll a die, you will get one of these 11 outcomes. It won't land on its corner. Could it land on its corner? Yeah, there's some problem of, uh, in, in, when this is discussed in, in probability classes, there's some it's like old story of a die that is rolled and then it hits against a rock and breaks in half. Right? Whatever. I mean, things could happen, right? But... But what happens, this is not what we're talking about in, in this scenario, right? What would we have to account for in real life situations, though? We might account for something else as being a, this very small likelihood uh, occurrence. Uh, but again, in most scenarios, those something else cases are not worth spending time on. All right, so what would happen if we had, instead of two die, two dice, if we had three dice, what are the outcomes possible then? What's the sample space look like? Three is the lowest, up to 18, because that's the, those are the possible values. How many things can happen? Six times six times six, which is 216. So what's the probability of rolling a three? One out of 216. And an 18 is also one out of 216. And then we need to calculate all the values in between. So how would we calculate all those values in between? Well, one way is to keep track of it, try to keep track of what's going on in terms of, of the values. Can we make a table for that? We need a 3D table, right? Can we make a 3D table? So let's see. We had the red and the blue. What could we do? We could make a 3D table that would need how many layers? Because here we have, we have 1 through 6. We have 1 through 6. And then we need 1 through 6 layers for the green, right? So we could have a green equals 1 layer. Then we could draw another one of these with the red and the blue and have green equals two layer. Yep. And then up to, up to six. So what could we do? We could make tables, which would be six 2D tables to represent the 3D scenario that we're looking at. And then just go through and count the values. It's doable, right? Yeah. What could we do? We could even split that up and each one of you make your own layer, and we can do this really quickly, right? And then just compile it all together to fill in all of these over 216, over 216, whatever they all happen to be. What about four dice? Just do that. Yeah, then we would have six of these. And then six times. Right? This, this, there'd be this. There'd be all, it'd be all of these. Right? There'd be all of these that would correspond to, what's the next color? Alpha. <laughs> okay, alpha. So what do we have? We have, the next one would go through one through six. It would be six of these. So 24 tables. 24 two-dimensional tables would give us the four-dimensional picture that we're looking at.
right? How many things would there be that would be six times six times six times six? What about five dice? Well, it can keep. Now, what happens? That pretty quickly becomes kind of too big, right? So we would probably want to find some kind of formulaic way to think about it, and do the calculations instead of doing it straightforward. But the idea is the same. Now, what if uh, going back to two dice, instead of saying what's the probability of each of one of these things, what if we looked at an event like what's the probability of rolling an even number? probability of rolling an even number, we go to all the even number cases and add those all together. Because each, if you were in one situation, you weren't in the other. All right, so this is the, the basic ideas of, uh, of probability. A lot more that we can go into. We're just going to look at a very small portion of what can happen. One thing that happens that we care about is what's called conditional probability. Conditional probability has to do with what's the probability of something happening given that something else has already happened. All right, so the idea here is what's the probability of some event that we care about happening given that something else has already happened. So the way we interpret this is, what's the probability of event E, event is the particular thing we care about, given that we've already observed something else happening? All right, so what's the probability that we have a bag of all banana sweets, given that we have already taken out one that's a banana? Right, we don't know what that is, but that's the kind of question we're talking about. What's the probability that it's a bag of bananas, sweets, given that we've already taken out a cherry? Well, what's the probability that it's only banana, 100% banana, given that we have already eaten a cherry? That would be zero, right? That wouldn't have happened. So sometimes it's easy to tell. Sometimes it's more involved to tell. But conditional probability. Um, and then there are things like, are you observing these things and, and returning something or taking something out? And so there's a whole bunch of other issues. Um, are we doing this with replacement, it's called, or without replacement? We're not going to worry too much about that. Um, it, it does have an effect, but, but we're going to, uh, to ignore this. All right. What we particularly care about is a famous theorem from the 18th century that's discussing what happens with probability and conditional probability. This is named after a person named Thomas Bayes. Often you will hear about the term that we're going to see it mostly in context with is it's called a Bayesian classifier. Um, and the theorem is Bayes' theorem. And I guess it depends on when, when you look and in which country you look. Um, Bayes was English. And so sometimes you see Bayes written like that, like Bayes' theorem. But you often hear it pronounced Bayes' theorem. So the, the words, you know, you have like St. James's as S apostrophe S. Uh, I say things that way, and I didn't realize that some people don't. And I don't know. You see it both ways. Anyway, how about we say this and avoid the whole the theorem of Bayes. That way we don't have to worry about apostrophes. Um, I've never seen it written like that uh, until just now. Um, so. What happens here, um, this is, this describes what happens to uh, the likelihood of an event given that you have seen other information, right? So this is a conditional probability um, description. So it says, what's the probability of event A given that we've already observed event B having happened? And 
there's a lot of background and a lot of other pieces. I'm going to give it to you, get, state the theorem, and then we will do an example so you can see how it works and what it means. Again, we're not doing a course in probability. We do not have all of the details. We aren't focusing on, on all of those pieces. But the theorem of Bayes says that the probability of A given event B can be calculated by finding the probability of B given that A happened times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. We're going to do some examples and see what, what this means, so don't, don't stress this too much. But let's think about what we're, what we're looking at. We're saying things like, what is the probability that our candy, right, the, the sweets bag we had was an H1 bag, given that, we, that we've eaten or taken out one, one piece of, of cherry? Right, remember, the H1 bag was all cherry. So what's the probability that it is that bag, given that the one you've taken out is a single cherry piece? Well, we don't know that. We don't know that probability. That's why we're going to calculate it. What do we know? Do we know that the probability of cherry, given that it's an H1 bag? What's the probability that it's cherry, given an H1 bag? That was the 100% cherry bag, right? That number would be 1. Then we would be trying to calculate the probability of cherry overall divided by, no, sorry, the probability of an H1 bag divided by the probability that anything was cherry. All right, so what happens? Do we know the probability of an H1 bag? Well, if we assume that the company made equal numbers of each type, then that number right here would be? 1 over 5. And then the probability that a piece was cherry, that a particular piece that the company made was cherry, 50%. Does that make sense? So what would we have? The probability of this would be 1 times 1 fifth divided by 1 half, which is? two-fifths. So if you just take out one and it's cherry, there's a 40% chance that you have all cherry. Again, assuming these values are correct. That's way more than you probably expected. Because all, what did we say earlier? We said all we did was rule out all banana. But what did we really do? We put it even more in favor. Now, there's a 60% that it wasn't all cherry. Right? 60% chance that it's not all cherry, but it, it doesn't just shift it to like, now it's a 25% chance that it's in that one. Right? It shifts it to like a 40-60%. Okay, so we had H1, H2, H3, H4, and H5, and that piece of data knocked this one out and now said this one is 40% likely, and all of these combined are 60% likely. It doesn't say that it's 20% each. Right? It might, we, we would have to calculate to see. It doesn't say that it's 20% each, but it says that this is now 40% likely. This is something different. Right? And that was just from observing one, the first one being cherry. Now what do you think happens if, well, okay, we, we'll look at some other examples in a minute. So to say, if it, if it were banana instead, what happens in this case, if it were banana instead? If it were banana instead, what's the probability of banana 
given that it's H1? That's zero. So the whole thing would be zero. All right, so the first one being cherry says now we have a 40% chance that it's all cherry. Again, this is being very loose with what's happening uh, in, the, right, in the interpretation there. Uh, or as actually not being loose with the interpretation, it's actually assuming a lot, right? Assuming all of these extra pieces. So let's see how this is, is often, um, often implemented. I'm not going to erase that part. Let's keep the, keep the formula. Let's say that we had, well, in terms of, of a test for um, a disease, so if you're testing for a disease, there's um, some different components that matter. There's what's called sensitivity. The sensitivity is called the true positive rate. The true positive rate means that you have the disease and the test says you have the disease. So there's no, no error had, has been made. Excuse me, this is the correct answer. So that is what's called the sensitivity of a test. The specificity of a test is you get a true negative. So it's the true negative rate. These are percentages, right? So what does a true negative mean? True negative means you don't have the disease, and the test tells you you don't have it. Now, what can go wrong? You have it, and the test says you don't. You don't have it, and the test says you do. Which of those is worse? You have it, and the test says you don't. Yeah, it's probably worse for you to have it, and the test say you don't, if it's like highly contagious. But what if it's not necessarily highly contagious, but the treatment is really bad? Then it's worse for you to not have it, and the tests say you do. Right? So even that, you can't say which is worse. It depends on other information around it. Right? The errors that you can make, which of those is worse, will depend on other stuff that's outside of the context that we have right now. We just know that there are two kinds of errors, and they could both be bad. One could be worse than the other in certain cases, or they could both be horrible in, in all cases. Um, and then there's one more aspect of this which is the prevalence of the disease. So the prevalence is kind of the percentage of people who have the disease. And this is talking in terms of disease. Um, it doesn't have to be something about disease. It could be something like a, a drugs test. And then in this case, it would be the percentage of people who, have, who use that drug. Right in the in the overall population, um, it could be anything that you're testing, like some way of testing, and but how likely uh, uh, something is matters in in the in the whole procedure. All right, so sensitivity um, is if you have the condition and the test says you have the condition, it's a percentage. So let's say we have uh, something that is 90%, has 90% sensitivity. All right, 90% sensitivity says that 90% of the time, if you have it, it tells you you have it. And let's say the specificity is, is only 80%, which says 80% of the time, if you don't have it, it tells you, don't, it tells you that you don't have it. Um, what does it mean that will happen sometimes? Both of these tell you that sometimes you will, in this case, 10% of the time you have it and it says you don't. 20% of the time you don't have it and it says you do. And let's say our situation for the percentage of people with this disease that only 5% of the people have it. Right? So it's fairly rare, but not completely rare. Now, what we think about with these values, then we think about these as decimal numbers. 
in our calculation, we'll put these in because the probabilities and the probabilities are always between zero and one, not between one and a hundred. Um, so the probabilities. All right. So sensitivity, specificity, and then the prevalence is is part of it. So what's the probability that you are sick given that you had a positive test? Okay, so let's think about what we have. We have a conditional scenario here. So we have a conditional scenario, and we want to fill in the pieces. So we would look at this and say, oh, I got... The test, it says, I, it says I'm positive, so we're thinking there's a 90% chance that I have this. But let's see. What is this going to be equal to? This is going to be equal to the probability of a positive test given that we actually are sick, right, times the probability probability that we're actually sick at all divided by the probability of the positive test. Okay. Let's see which parts of this we know right now. What's the probability of a positive test given that we're sick? That's your 90%, right? The probability of a positive test, given that we are sick, that's the 90%. What's the probability that we're sick at all? That's the 0 0.05. Now, what's the probability of a positive test? The probability of a positive test, we have to do a little bit more work to calculate that. How can you get positive tests? You can get a positive test and actually be sick, or you can get a positive test and actually be well. All right, so the probability of a positive test is going to be the probability of the positive test given that we are sick, times the probability that we're actually sick, plus the situation that happens when we're well. Positive test given that we're well, times the probability that we actually were well. Now, there's a little bit of thinking that goes into why that works, but that is the, this, this is valid. So what numbers, I have to go right again. So what numbers do we have? So what do we have in the denominator? Probability of a positive test, given that we are sick, is the 0.9. Then we're going to multiply that by the probability of being sick, which is only 0 0.05. And then add to that the probability of a positive test, given that we're well. Well, the probability of a positive test, given that we're well, would be a false negative. So that would be the 0.2. And then what's the probability that we're well? 95%, right? So 0.95.
So what happens if we do that calculation right there? Somebody do that calculation for me. Yeah. You test positive, there's about a 19% chance you're actually sick. Not 90%. About 19%. Because with this test, what happens more often than not? More often than not, there's so many people who are well that the number of well people who have a false positive that it right the false positives are they overwhelm everything else right the false the mistakes overwhelm everything else so in this particular situation even though the 90% sounds really big 80% sounds oh, that's pretty good right the fact that it's such a rare disease Kind of overwhelms everything else. You tested positive. What do you what do you say to the doctor? You test positive for this disease. You say, I'm I'm so glad that I don't have it. <laughs> right? Now, what happens in some situations? In some situations, these numbers are much higher. They're much better. So what does that mean? Well, that might mean that this goes up unless the disease is even more rare. And then it can still mean, if you tested positive, you probably don't have it. What if it's 100%, 100%? Then it's correct. It doesn't matter how prevalent the disease is if it tests, except there are no 100% sensitive and 100% specific tests out there. They might be 100% in one way or the other, but usually not even that. Um, and 90, 95, these are great percentages. So what you get to experiment with uh, on the assignment are some different values in different places and see what actually happens. So the main thing from this theorem uh, is that seeing data do usually doesn't mean what we think. And it's not the expectation or not the outcome that we would typically associate with a particular scenario. Uh, we are bad as humans at probability because we have always, um, through our evolutionary process, we have been most focused on avoiding certain kinds of errors. Like, why do you tend to see faces in things where there's not really a face? If there's something there and you see a face in it, what happened millennia ago? If you saw a face and you ignored it and it was a real face, you, you got eaten. If it wasn't a real face, it took you a few seconds to realize and then you went on your way. And so the kind of error that we are focused on, we're fo we focus probabilistically on uh, you know, our, our emotions. Our, our, we focus on things that feel more pressing even though they might not be. And we always mess up. No matter how much experience we have with probability, people mess up and overinflate things that they shouldn't and underinflate things that they also shouldn't, right? It should go the other way. Um, all right, so uh, we could talk about lots of other scenarios. These, this is the one that we need for classification kind of purposes, trying to figure out what category something should be in based on what we've seen so far. We've got these pieces with these pieces in place. Where should we put this? Now, we will only be able to do this in a probabilistic way. Saying we're, 
We have this much confidence that this thing should be in this category. It's not, oh, it's guaranteed. I mean, sometimes it's guaranteed. But very rarely is something guaranteed to be in a particular category when we're doing, doing this kind of classification. It's more like we are this confident that it should be in this place. So rather than looking at the probability in the sense of in this way, instead of how many times something can happen divided by whatever, this is what, what's our level of belief? And that's what this theorem really concentrates on. What's the level of belief in something based on the data, based on the evidence? What happens as you get more evidence? You can, it will change the probabilities. It will change pieces. I think that kicked off.